throughout motorcycle history, there have been very few brands to take hold of an entire country the way that, say, Harley-Davidson has here in America. It seems as though the Harley effect is really a unique thing. Even companies like Honda and BMW and Ducati haven't necessarily captured their own home markets to the extent that a company like Harley has. Often those brands find a home somewhere else across the sea. But there is one other, one company that has managed to survive against all odds in a home where despite much reason and logic and practicality, it is a revered brand, and that brand is Royal Enfield. Let's look closer at the company Royal Enfield and how it became almost synonymous with Indian motorcycling culture and why all of this matters. Royal Enfield was, at one time, one of the great British motorcycle companies, alongside the likes of Triumph and Norton and BSA competing on the world stage for motorcycle dominance. First known as Enfield Manufacturing at the end of the 19th century, the company was busy building sewing parts and bicycle parts and gun parts. In 1901, they built their first motorcycle, and that makes Royal Enfield arguably the oldest true motorcycle company in the world. About a decade later, Royal Enfield would build their first in-house motor for their motorcycles, a 350 and 425 cc V-twin, now this era was incredibly important for Royal Enfield. Many overlook the V-twins of Royal Enfield, but these were great machines and incredibly stylish and innovative for their time. Royal Enfield's current CEO, responsible in many ways for revitalizing the company, points to this era and this period as his favorite in Royal Enfield's history. And to me, this might mean that we could be getting some new V-twins out of the company soon. But, you know, we'll see. Anyways, this era marked Royal Enfield's ability to really differentiate itself from the competition. I mean, virtually every other British company at this time was building, you know, sporting singles and then ultimately moving to building, you know, vertical twins. And in this way, Royal Enfield's offerings at this time were much more in line with actually American motorcycles. And though the company was competitive in terms of offerings during these early years and did take their stabs at racing and would ultimately have success in, you know, off-road racing especially, it wasn't until the late 40s that the company would really begin to find what we now know of as, you know, their long-standing identity, building big, thumpy singles. Obviously, there were some other incredible and in many ways defining motorcycles along the way for Royal Enfield, culminating in things like the Interceptor in the 1960s, which in its day was the fastest big British twin that you could buy. But it's really, you know, a few years before and a few years after World War II that we see a bike known as the Bullet, a truly iconic and innovative machine that would really carry the company until recently. Now for the bullet, Royal Enfield would reuse an old tagline dating back to 1900 when they released something called the quadricycle, and the phrase was made like a gun. This is important and we'll talk about it later. Now the bullet name also harkens back to another four-wheeled prototype from the company from 1910, but in this case, the name and tagline finally stuck with what would become the single most compelling motorcycle that Royal Enfield has ever built, and that even includes their new product line. But this was a different kind of big British single, innovative in a very different way than the likes of, say, Velocet with their Thruxton or BSA's Gold Star, first released in 1931, but really coming into its own in 1935, when the engine was switched to being vertical instead of a sloper, and retaining the enclosed valve gear and gear-driven magneto, but again, it's post-war 1948 revival of the bullet that would really change everything for Royal Enfield. You have to understand, most companies that released quote-unquote new models after the war, well, they weren't really new models, and the general public was thoroughly disappointed with many of the offerings. And to an extent, this was also true of Royal Enfield for a time, but Royal Enfield beat many companies to the punch with an all-new iteration of the Bullet in 1948. And that motorcycle really was a game-changer and massively influential, especially in terms of suspension. So swing-arm suspension was not an entirely new concept, but what Royal Enfield did with the Bullet was attached two essentially shock absorbers to the rigid part of the frame and the swing arm. This is such a simple and appealing and, you know, looking back obvious solution to having better suspension. 
and this was really useful. It had been tested by Roy Lanfield on trials and off-road machines, but here the company was bringing it to their production road-going motorcycles with the bullet, and literally within a few years, every other company was using this system and this would go on to be pretty much the basis for all rear suspension for motorcycles. So the Bullet is such an innovative and important motorcycle in motorcycle history. The Bullet wasn't the lightest, fastest British single that you could buy, even when it was released soon after in its 500cc form, but it was an affordable, reliable, useful road-going machine with loads of character, and it had a standout design among other British bikes, and especially British singles, from this era. Royal Enfield would release all sorts of other bikes, including sporting twins, and of course the Bullet would be updated quite a bit throughout its lifetime, and there's loads of other important motorcycles from Royal Enfield. I don't want to just be skipping over those, but it really is the Bullet that really gets at the heart of what Royal Enfield would be all about, as they eventually would take hold in India. Now this all started in 1955, when a kit version of the 350cc bullet was sent to India so that they could be able to manufacture their own complete motorcycles. See, a few years prior, at the beginning of the 1950s, the Indian Army ordered a bunch of Royal Enfield bullets to use for their border patrol. The bullet's off-road success had convinced them that this was the bike to choose for them, but by the mid-50s, an initiative to promote domestic production was going to bring an end to that partnership, so Royal Enfield made a strategic decision to start manufacturing Royal Enfield bullets in Madras, which is now Chennai. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I probably am not. Now, I don't think the company really had a clue how important this move to basically building bikes in India would prove to be, not just because of their commitment to make bikes outside of their home country so early, I mean, everybody does it now, but this was a very different time, but that commitment to domestic production would set a precedent going forward for Royal Enfield in India, and a culture there of favoring in-country manufacturers over imported machines, this would ultimately set Royal Enfield up for success, you know, in a very similar way to American policies creating a lot of success for Harley-Davidson. As the Indian factories learned more and more about how to build these motorcycles in-house, it became apparent that the British headquarters were less necessary. You know, for a while, the engines were still designed and built in-house in the UK and sent over, but as the British motorcycle industry slowly went under, everything would basically be moved to being in-home in India. Now, the Bullet really positioned itself as the perfect motorcycle for Indian riders in these early years. It was the kind of motorcycle that could be ridden anywhere, you could abuse it, and sure, it would fall apart, but they were such simple motorcycles to work on and really infinitely repairable. Didn't matter the quality of gas, the bikes just kept running. And slowly over time, the bullet took on a different sort of light in India, though Enfield would attempt to build smaller, more affordable machines, mini bullets as they were known. These would rarely take hold. The bullet took on a life of itself, ultimately as a truly aspirational machine for young Indian riders. In a sense, overpriced as the decades would pass, but unique in and of itself and holding a unique character within the country. By, for example, the 1990s, it was the bike that your dad told stories about, and it didn't matter that, you know, a Japanese enduro bike was twice the bike a Royal Enfield Bullet was, it just wasn't about that. You know, many a boy grew up with core memories in India thumping around on the back of their father's bullet. If you guys want to get a taste of this spirit in India of motorcycling, look no further than the amazing documentary, which is free to watch on YouTube called Chasing the Bullet. It's fantastic and it will shed so much more light than I can on why the bullet is so important in India. Now in this, Royal Enfield was able to create a sort of cult status around their motorcycles in India, a bike that truly was seen as a product of their home country unlike anything, at least in terms of motoring, in India. India really was not known as a hub for automotive manufacturing the way that they're starting to become today. To Indians, Royal Royal Enfield was theirs, and it stayed theirs while the rest of the world pined after bigger, faster, crazier motorcycles from the likes of Honda and Yamaha and Ducati. Now Indians just wanted that thumpy little machine that smelled like their own history and made noises that brought them back to their childhood. Even as worldwide competition threatened to kill companies like Harley, protective Indian policies kept the bullet alive and with little need for innovation from the company. Of course, the time did come for India to open up and allow for competition, especially from the Japanese companies, and this really did all but kill Royal Enfield, which brings us to the current era of the company, which I've covered at length in a video I made on the Royal 
minefield interceptor, I'll have a card pop up now if you're interested in that video. But beyond just their revitalization as a company, which could in fact be a blueprint for other struggling companies like Harley, what is it that made Royal Enfield such a beloved company at home in India? Much like Harley Davidson, there was an element of character with these bikes that was slowly just kind of disappearing in the motorcycle world through the 80s and 90s. Motorcycles and motorcycle companies have experienced success in different areas and in different locations for many different reasons, whether it's a focus on improved performance like the British bikes through really the 40s, 50s, and 60s, or reliability and comfort and ease of use like the Japanese bikes of the 70s, or beauty and, you know, a sort of exotic flair like we see from Italian manufacturers today. A motorcycle can be appealing for two main reasons in my opinion. Either it's really good at something, you know, let's say a dirt bike or a sport bike or an adventure bike, or it makes you feel something. Obviously the real sweet spot is when a motorcycle has both, but that's very rare. But sometimes a motorcycle sits so far on the feel and emotional spectrum that it really doesn't matter if it's categorically good at anything. And that would describe Royal Enfield's offerings for almost 50 years. The Bullet, which was basically Royal Enfield's only bike for about five decades, I mean, imagine Harley only made the Sportster for like 40 or 50 years. Well, the Bullet eventually became a motorcycle that wasn't really good at anything. Sure, there was a time when its innovative suspension setup and torquey single cylinder really did make sense for riders in India and on, you know, India's rugged terrain, but not since the 60s really has it really been a motorcycle that makes much sense. It's not fast, it wasn't powerful, it wasn't really very comfortable, it didn't necessarily handle better than any other bike. The idea that a country's particular motorcycle is is perfect for their landscape doesn't really make sense anymore. At one point, that was certainly true for Harley, for example, making big sort of touring bikes while everybody else was making, you know, lighter, faster motorcycles. But in the end, the best motorcycle at this point for long distance travel here in America is the most comfortable, most reliable machine. Virtually any adventure bike offering wins over a big cruiser if you're going to ride thousands of miles. You know, they're comfortable, the posture is better, they're better for big trips, and this is why Harley decided to make their own big adventure bike. The same is true of India's rugged terrain. In the same way that the ideal motorcycle for much of India is a small adventure bike or dual sport, yeah, this kind of just makes the bullet seem obsolete. So what is it? Why did this motorcycle and this company have such a hold on this country? Sometimes it's the idea and the ideal. Just like Harley makes big, loud, characterful bikes that don't necessarily make much sense, especially for their price, so has Royal Enfield also done the same in their home market. Market. A 500cc single was long considered a big bike in India. The name Royal Enfield itself, right, that may mean very little to you and I. Many riders haven't even ever heard of a Royal Enfield until recently. It's like Ural is now. I mean, today it's synonymous with retro twins and what the company has to offer, but in India, Royal Enfield is so much more than that. It harkens back to a different time in the country's history, probably a simpler time, no doubt. Maybe you saw one as a kid and you mimicked your father's longing to own it, or maybe your uncle had one and you remember him riding up to or riding away from your house. Maybe there was one parked in a barn nearby and you sat on it, pretending to ride it. That big, thumping, single sound. A sound you can really feel, much like the rumbling of big Harley V twins here in America. These things create core memories in us that we can't shake, and no amount of logic when it comes to getting your own bike can replace the impact that these kinds of bikes have. If you grew up you know, seeing Harleys all the time, or you grew up around Honda CBs, or you grew up around, you know, Royal Enfield single cylinder bullets. Those motorcycles are ingrained in you as what a motorcycle should sound like and look like and feel like. And so when someone comes along with a motorcycle that makes more sense, well, it doesn't make more sense to you. It's more than the sound though, it's the feel, and Harley riders today will understand this, as this is where manufacturers like Harley and Royal Enfield stick out. That slogan that has long been used by Royal Enfield to describe their bullet, which is made like a gun, isn't really a statement about reliability. At least that's not how I interpret it. It's more about the tactile, mechanical feel of the bike, you know, mechanical, simple things. People talking about, for example, a transmission in a car having that rifle bolt feel. That's what I 
think Roy Lanfield has been getting at when they used to say that the bullet was made like a gun, like a solid mechanical watch that clicks nicely. These types of machines are appealing to our brains because we can feel and see what's happening more than, for example, digital machines. I mean, good lord, the Interceptor still has a cable throttle versus the more popular and supposedly better throttle by wire. How ironic that after everything, falling out of favor as a truly British company, that it's Royal Enfield that would now take over the world as a motorcycle manufacturer, building bikes for people who really want the British ideal of a motorcycle. And that brings us to today, how is it that Royal Enfield has come out of all this, having almost went bankrupt, to being, in my opinion, one of the most valuable brands in the entire industry? How did Royal Enfield go from initially being a British company offering models that the Indian market wanted, versus now being an Indian company offering bikes for those enamored with British heritage? Royal Enfield really has created a sort of blueprint for success for how to save a dying motorcycle company. I mentioned earlier how motorcycle companies have thrived and taken off in history for various reasons, and today Royal Enfield is succeeding worldwide for a few simple reasons, and it gets at the heart of what motorcycling is all about to most riders. Simple, affordable, beautiful, reliable machines. That's it. Motorcycles that are cool, that are fun, modern enough, at least where it counts, but not too modern to where they're getting crazy expensive or just having silly extra things. Motorcycles that really speak to what riding has always been about, not going 160 miles an hour or having the flashiest model, but just regular guys and girls like you and me who just want to ride and are happy to just go for a ride. We don't need ride by wire throttles. In fact, we don't really want those things. We don't need to know our lean angle. You know, I get there's a point for those things, but most motorcyclists don't care. We don't even need heated grips. Just a great looking, great sounding bike that we can jump on at any time and that we can buy without completely breaking the bank to get it. And hopefully Harley is listening, but more importantly, I hope every manufacturer is paying attention to Royal Enfield and learning from them because they're doing it right. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos if you liked this one. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. Ride safe.